so let me try. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right, thanks. I cannot do this. Hey, Zoom people, can you guys hear us? But if I do Zoom, I need to do this. It's great. Okay, cool. Can I just not do this? <laughs> what would you want? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, can I just walk around, not do this? <laughs> oh, oh, uh, you want to? You want to? I think it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's okay. Um, just grab this one. Uh, that's, that's too much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is exactly the time. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to uh, today's CI seminar. Um, uh, here I present Xiaolong from uh, University uh, UCSD. Where, where? <laughs> Um, and I guess I've known Salon for uh, like a, a while now, uh -huh. uh, and uh, I've always been impressed by like the type of problem Salon tries to tackle and like uh, the really beautiful like uh, demos you get, um, like, you know, like uh, all of these, uh, like from all of these projects. So I guess like without further ado, uh, I'll let him get started with the, the talk today. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Um, so today, uh, our lab actually works on uh, kinds of uh, in the intersection of vision and robotics, uh, because today is like an EI seminar, so I maybe only talk about robotics today, a little bit vision in the middle. Uh, so before going to this, like the fancy vision things we have, or well, fancy robotics we have seen, I'm actually going to go through this, uh, this small clip a little bit, I fast forward, it's very long. Um, so it's actually from a, for, uh, from a debate that happened 50 years ago, on uh, whether the general purpose robot is a mirage. Uh, so it's an AI debate kind of thing. Um, so this is uh, basically a demo I like a lot from it that uh, is actually doing this uh, assembling task for this like uh, the small toy car. Um, so putting in the robot learning community nowadays, this is still a very impressive demo. Um, so, so I think it's just make people wonder uh, what is happening uh, over these 50 years uh, comparing to this demo. Um, so I think that uh, uh, important progress, at least we try to claim in robot learning is that we try to uh, work on uh, more than just one object and then also uh, more than one environment and one task. So um, this kind of uh, generalization ability we try to put to, to the robot, uh, essentially we do see a lot of uh, progress in terms of vision and language. Um, so for example, in the perception side, uh, Developing from here, uh, we, we, we see an obvious improvement that we can have much better recognition systems nowadays for vision. And then for language, of course, everyone is talk about, talking about LM. I also pay my $20 to um, pay, uh, make my lives easier uh, nowadays. Um, so there's a lot of this progress in vision and, and language in a data-driven way to make it generalizable uh, to apply everywhere. Um, so what, what do we get? out of it for, from robotics. Um, so a lot of people are trying to, researchers are trying to uh, migrate this kind of idea on using data-driven approach, generalization approach, pre-training, large-scale training um, to help you to do robotics tasks. So there's a lot of pre-training work. Uh, for example, you train your models on large-scale videos, and then you try to uh, use it pre-train, and then you do some tasks for robot. Uh, but really what we have seen so far is still a lot of applications are still basically focusing on more relatively simple, like a parallel gripper grasping and place task. And then a lot of cases they show also it's not really generalizing across uh, different scenes or objects. And fundamentally for me, it's also, uh, I, I'm also very kind of, uh, uh, I, I, for myself it's also very, it's a mystery that why is this like large scale portraying things on vision is helping these physical uh, interactions in, in this task and how much it is actually helping. Um, so to dive this a little bit deeper, we actually recently have a word, uh, it's, it's in ICML, but it has nothing to do with theory or algorithm. We essentially try to just download a uh, lot of code people use for this like uh, pre-training for robotics and then just replace the large models with um, a few layer of complex and then train from scratch. And, and interestingly, we see that 
um, we actually get on par of better performance compared to use large pre-training model. So I feel like actually a lot of cases is like um, we, we still need stronger baseline before uh, like, like seeing that is actually helping. Uh, of course, there's um, some uh, mismatch in here in the sense that the large pre-train model is basically uh, trained on this video data set or, or image data set, lateral images. And then when you transfer to robot data set, there's a domain gap. Uh, but essentially what we see here is basically uh, there's still not that much uh, development compared to um, train from scratch and using the features from there. Um, so this is something that, uh, so, so maybe still uh, some, somewhere to, to, to so a lot of space to, to go to, to how to utilize these pre-trained models. Um, so that's what we see for vision models. And, and for language models, we see a lot of uh, demos from Google that use like uh, a language model to do planning. Um, so essentially the idea is you, you, the language model will help you to generate these kinds of um, uh, plans. And then you, you connect these uh, small skills together using these language model plans. Um, so the assumption is always inside this work is that all these skills that is pre-trained, uh, you have all these skills and then you need the language to connect them together. So, uh, so all this is great, uh, but essentially in a short summary, we see that uh, the, the language model is helping you to connect the skills and then you can have these vision models pre-trained to help you to, to learn individual skills. Um, but what is missing, I feel like in terms of uh, helping generalization to do more complex tasks is that uh, for each individual skills, we are still, uh, at least in the learning community, we are still not very well explore um, to utilize the geometry reasoning and, and the contact reasoning when we are trying to learn these skills. So we are still staying in very simple skills. And then we just assume that th those skills are there and then you can just use the language to connect them. Um, but, but how to actually do individual complex skills uh, is still something that is far from soft. Um, so especially, so in this talk, I, I'm going to talk about is basically uh, studying how to learn these kind of skills for, for both hands and legs and then um, to uh, which has rich contact, geometry contacts and, and reasoning. Um, so starting from hands. So the reason I like hands is because first of all, um, it's an interesting problem that reinforcement learning people would think is very hard problem because it's high degree of freedom. Um, so if they say, oh, there's high degree of freedom, RL is very hard to train and this and that. But then from the robotics perspective, uh, it's actually a very uh, a intense contact. And then if you actually have a lot good closure of the object, usually the grasping is really uh, robust and you have a more robust grasping. It's actually kind of easier problems when you are uh, doing uh, tasks like grasping. So this kind of uh, like, like contrast between uh, for learning is harder, but, but somehow for application is easier. Uh, is very interesting to me. And then in terms of the, uh, the, the format of the manipulator, given these kinds of multi-finger hands is very close to the, the, the human hand, it kind of um, give you more potentials on how uh, learning from humans. So essentially, how do you migrate human knowledge, how human hands manipulating object to robots, how to do better imitation learning. This is also very interesting to me. And then last, uh, context. So when people are talking about context, studying context, uh, usually we are placing your tactile sensor on the parallel grippers uh, fingertip. Um, but when it comes to the hands, we find out that actually a lot of surfaces inside the uh, on the hand uh, is where you actually contact the objects. Um, so you make us rethink about how, uh, how should we use tactile sensing? How do we study context um, when we are uh, using the manipulator? Uh, and then for legs, essentially we are, um, so, so I like it because it's running outside. Um, so, so you, you go outside the world, I look at the real problems. And then um, it, 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 from the vision perspective, it also, also offer a lot of uh, possibilities to basically uh, use 3D reasoning, scene understanding to help you improve the, uh, the local motion control. Um, so around this, uh, two topics, basically, there's something uh, I want to discuss today is basically uh, three, three directions. So the first is actually uh, about tactile sensing. Um, so, uh, so how do you use, use touch, explore touch with hands, and then how to scale up data to, to get more data to learn more general policy, and then how to learn uh, better 3D representations 
um, as, as basically extracting uh, the scene and, and also object level features uh, for robot better to navigate or manipulation. So let's start from touch. Um, so for the touch side, essentially in this work, uh, is the RSS work we have. Um, so we try to basically learn to uh, do in-hand manipulation, rotate objects without, uh, without using any vision. So we just try to place the object in the hand and then by feeling about these objects, we can um, just uh, do manipulation based on that without seeing. Um, so again, there's a lot of uh, tactile sensors approach from, from here as well. And I think, uh, like I said before, a lot of focus are actually focus, uh, focusing on tactile sensing on the fingertips. In here, we try to see in the whole hand, uh, essentially also partially multiplied by these glove things that are also from here. Um, so essentially, can we actually have tactile sensing all over the hand? Um, so our design is in here is basically that uh, we have this Aleko hand. And then essentially, we try to place the sensor all over the hand. So essentially, we have 16 sensors, and then we place in every joint, and then fall on the point in, in here. Um, so so we, we try to basically do uh, more dense sensing instead of just like uh, on focusing on the fingertip. And, and the, this kind of sensor is actually quite cheap. So it's uh, basically a $12 sensor, uh, FSR sensor. You can buy, buy it from Amazon. Um, I, I, I can, if you search FSR sensor in Amazon, you can just find it. Um, so one unique things we do in here is essentially uh, during training time, um, training this policy, we actually try to uh, use this sensor and binarize it. So we only think about whether the sensor is, is something touch or not touching this sensor. So by using the binarization, um, so essentially uh, here is example. So this is the continuous signals when you touch the sensor, you get, and this is basically the binary signals when you touch the sensor and you get that. Um, so the idea of using binary sensor is basically is very easy for doing sim to real. So essentially, if you think about simulating the tactile sensing, uh, there's a lot of work uh, on that, but then it's always there will be a large sim to real gap how to model the deformation, how do you model the visual tactile sensing and, and this and that. Um, but if you are able to make it, it is binary, it is contact and not contact, then it's essentially there's very, almost uh, basically reduce the sim and real gap by a large margin. So, and then if you are able to uh, place the binary sensor all over your hand, essentially uh, you have a lot of binary together, you can actually model a rich state um, information of the object on your hand. So what we did is basically we just um, like, like uh, simulated a lot of the shape of objects and then uh, put in Isaac gym and then basically try to uh, learn this kind of rotate these objects only using this binary tactile sensing uh, as input. Um, so we train a PPO reinforcement learning policy on top and then directly generalize the review. I don't want to go into the policy, it's very simple. We just feel layer, feel like works, uh, but then it essentially takes the contact information as input and the action then the current state of the robot as input and then uh, output the action. Um, so here is basically one detail into what is happening. So essentially you can see some, uh, some, some pause in here. So it's, that's like uh, there's a pause, means there's a contact. Um, so that's what it shows that um, it actually when you're manipulating object, you will see these kinds of uh, contacts happening in different time in different sensors. And then basically uh, there is some curves. So essentially what I want to show you here is saying that uh, it's very important for generalization in the sense that if you want to train and test on the same object, uh, having a sensor and not having a sensor does not matter that much. You can just memorize your object. Um, but if you actually want to train and test on different objects or train a large set of objects and test on a large set of objects, um, so it does show that using a sensor, using this tactile sensor, again, without any vision, I, the, the blue curve is using the sensor, it gives much, uh, it's much more useful. Um, so it's showing the generalization aspect and, and multiple object aspect. So you, does, you do need the, I mean, you, uh, on the surface, it looks like you can do closed loop, but, but then uh, open loop, but then you actually need to, you do need to sense the object and feel about the object to, um, to basically uh, do, do it well. If you have multiple objects, you need to, yes. 
Uh, the rotation reward is actually, uh, do I have the size? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so essentially it's like this. So it's basically, uh, it, it's uh, always uh, just, we, we train free access. So essentially you have, uh, you can see as free individual uh, policies, but actually share a policy. Uh, you can see as free individual policy, and then you just, uh, you just want to rotate in one direction as much angle as possible. We compute the angles and then we just like rotate as large angle as possible. Um, so, so that's the, 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 the reward here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, any, any other questions? Uh, let yeah. me, yes. So it's multitask. It's doing much better on multitasking. Right. So it's multitask means that you you train with multiple objects. Um. So so it's uh, it's not it's not X Y Z multiple access. It's actually saying um, you train with train and test with multiple objects versus train and test on a single object. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um. Yeah. So keep going. Um, I think a very interesting thing I did, uh, we did after this training this legwork is that we try to understand if this information is sufficient to actually understand the object. Um, so what we do is basically we have the object in our hand, we have the policy, we just rotate the object to, to, to like complete one circle. And then we collect the tactile information, the, the, the touch information, and forward the legwork to train a legwork to basically do uh, shape reconstruction. And then we find that it actually can do uh, quite reasonable uh, shape reconstruction given this uh, touch sensing after rotating one circle. So essentially show that uh, like, like this kind of sparse signals, uh, uh, but with binary signals, but uh, with one, one circle of contact, it actually can kind of sense uh, the shape. Uh, of the object, uh, we didn't use it for manipulation, but essentially just want to show that there's enough information to actually capture the object shape and, and, and pose um, to, so, so that, that's why it can help this kind of uh, manipulation. Um, so that's basically, um, so, so in, in real, we have a lot of uh, tests on different objects as well. There's uh, this kind of, um, um, like like uh, more soft object as well. And then the, the most difficult is the dark one. Um, so here is some uh, real visualization. Again, on the top is basically showing that we can um, just have different sensors activated in different stage. Uh, we can close the light. Uh, so actually it takes some effort to close light. We, we share the floor and then uh, if I close light, everyone <laughs> stop working. Um, so, so we only have this demo because we need everyone uh, uh, stop working. Um, so, uh, um, so, so that's, um, uh, we have some comparison of course, like uh, if you do open loop, if you don't use uh, touch sensing uh, and then it's much, much worse. Um, um, yeah, so, so open loop is still fine. Uh, it's not that, but, but you can see you just keep using the same, um, same motion, it's not really, um, rotating the object. Um, so there's generalization demos and then also uh, the most challenging part we, uh, we have, among the objects we have is still the, the, the rubber duck. Rubber duck. Um, so, so it got some stuck in the middle, but then it, is, it, it can rotate. Um, so take, take some time. Um, and then we work on soft object as well. Um, so no, nothing is trained in simulation. It's just directly generalized to real. Uh, we have a tomato. Uh, used it multiple times, still working. Um, so um, and uh, apples and and yeah, so so still work reasonably. Um, so at least it's not squeezing. The, um, um, yeah. So there's different axes. So we try. Um, so there's actually y axis where you rotate in this way, and then there's x axis where you rotate in this way. Um, so you can see as separate policy. Um, train, train on. So, so the, the rotation is just like keep rotating one direction. It's not about reorientate to a particular goal, uh, goal, goal position, but it's just one direction uh, so far in here. Um, so we have a demonstration showing that we can connect this policy together. So essentially you can uh, use a keyboard control. Uh, you can first rotate this direction and then rotate with that directions. Um, so yeah, so this is just another that demonstrations, this is Y axis, and then you can also do uh, Z axis in here. Um, yeah, let me know, yes. And how many different shapes of objects do you use to train it? 
Yeah, I think in test set is basically um, for, for, for actual evaluation. Um, so we just use this once um, to, to get the numbers. Um, so we did actually, when we report the number, we, we did actually test on policy with different seeds. So like we test on three seeds and baseline everything. So it's a, a lot of experiments, um, but we just, when we are playing with it, we also apply to just random objects we can find. So this is, we, we showed the, the, the rotation here, but it's not, we didn't evaluate on the, these objects. Um, but for evaluation, we, we on the paper, we use, use those objects. Yeah, um, it's quite random, just um, is it all a, a fixed object set from somewhere? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Did you choose the, say, the shape of these objects like randomly or your way to choose it? Um, I mean, yeah. randomly, but not so random. For, for example, actually, uh, um, like um, for the y direction, right? So if you want to do this thing, it's very hard to do this thing, right? So, so if you place it here, and then you do this, it's very hard, very much easier to do this. Um, so, so there's basically uh, like this. Um, so, so I think for Z axis, it's generally fine, um, but, but for Y and X axis, it's actually much harder. Uh, you kind of need to place object uh, to in the right way to, to be able to, uh, yeah, yeah, for example, this will not work if I cannot do it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yes? So, um... Three different uh, objects. Uh, well, uh, so you can like take the friction. The same all for like uh, how much the friction is. Um. Right. So I think it's just like um, there's definitely friction, but in general, when we're training this our policy, we just do crazy kinds of uh, randomization uh, in, in physics two parameters. Um. And, and basically consider all kinds of fiction and just keep randomizing it. And, and then it kind of generalized well. Um, there's also latency actually. Um, uh, so, so for example, uh, when you touch and then get to the action, there's sort of latency. So we actually do consider that as well. Uh, we kind of calculate it, uh, like how much latency is happening in the real world. And then we just, because simulator is just instant. So we actually add some latency inside the simulator to kind of match the real world. So the, there's this sort of thing, randomization plus some matching identification. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, we, we can move on. So, so the, the next stop is actually uh, about uh, teleoperation. Um, and then in this work, actually, uh, it starts from uh, 2022. We recently has an extension. So essentially, uh, so, so we try to do teleoperation and the first work is about actually doing teleoperation inside simulator. So the idea is that when we are talking about learning from demonstrations, especially in the learning community, where every time you think about, talk about learning from demonstrations is going to be one shot demonstration, one shot imitation learning, zero shot imitation learning, or few shot imitation learning, that you just have the assumption that you have limited uh, like a, a, a limited access to number of demonstrations, but that's not the way that uh, vision people think about things. Vision people basically just want as many data as we can. Um, so essentially this goal, this, this basically, this idea is try to scale up the demonstrations, the interaction data as much as possible uh, uh, in, in a more scalable way. So this is um, a setup we have now. Um, so, so we've uh, computer and iPad, uh, we can do visual teleoperations. Um, so I, I will directly go to the procedure. So this is my student user, some of you might know him. Um, so he basically this work is first you, this is in the calibration stage. Okay, so you have this pen in front of your camera and you calibrate, you convert your human hand into this physical hand inside the simulator. And then uh, once you have this hand in simulation, you can basically do manipulations inside the simulators uh, using your RGB camera. And then you basically, in this demo is opening a door, you can watch your uh, different, different views of these uh, simulations, and then you can capture the data like this. Um, so this hand is actually a hand design. Um, it can be designed for different humans. I might skip the, the, the slides in here, but essentially we want to have, um, uh, be, friend, uh, be friendly to different uh, users. Uh, if you have small hand, then I'll give you a small hand. 
If you have larger hand, we give you a larger hand in science simulation. Um, and it's matching the kinematics of humans, so you feel very natural to control it. Um, and then basically, once you uh, collect this data, we can do uh, retargeting to convert it to different types of robot hands we care, for example, the bilateral hands. And it is showing that on the top left, we have this human collected demonstrations, and then we do, can do retargeting to different, uh, different kinds of hands. So essentially it's about, um, the, the title is about, uh, the title is from one hand to multiple hands. So the idea in here mostly is about if you can, you can collect data once and then you can convert it to, into different hands used for different robots. Um, so we do some imitation learning. I'm not going to go into detail in here. It's about PPO plus BC uh, behavior cloning term. Um, so we show that basically if you do well in, um, if you incorporate human data in manipulations, you basically have a more robust and more uh, robust for sim to real transfer kind of grasping. So essentially your grasp pose is more robust then, then you will not slip the object away. And then we have a lot of tasks like flipping a cup when you train for RL is just try to scratch the surface of the cup and that is very hard to transfer. But if you can put your finger into the cup to rotate it, uh, it's much easier to transfer. Um, so this is a system we made that we try to scale up the data, uh, but then it's still not very convenient to use in the sense that it's working for a particular simulator. And, and we, we show some results on imitation learning and transfer to the real, um, but essentially uh, we want it to be accessible for everyone and, and different platforms. Um, so essentially there's like the Lex work that uh, is an internship project that uh, we essentially try to scale this teleoperation system to any, any platform, any robot, any, any um, simulators. It's called any teleop. You can do diverse arms, diverse hands, diverse camera, diverse deployment environments. Um, so essentially we show that, uh, we try to demonstrate that it can be applied to real robot. You can be applied to Sapient uh, because it's from UCSD. You can apply to Isaac Gym because it's, it's NVIDIA internship project. Um, so we, we, we are supporting a lot, a lot of things like Mojoku and, and Pipulik as well. It's not showing here. Um, so essentially uh, here is a demo showing that you can play piano. So, so this is also using one camera in here that uh, you, you can do uh, this kind of uh, manipulation just in the air, but, but uh, still quite accurately inside simulators. And then you can do robot, uh, with new robot, this is a setup in our lab. Uh, so, so there's a real sense facing on the foot and then you basically uh, should be the hand here. So you try to just manipulate um, this, this hand on the side. Um, and here is a lot of demo. Um, so, so this is being how is the master student, master student. Um, yeah, so it's the same system, same interface uh, can be accessible um, to software and hardware. Uh, we just try to generalize it, um, make, make, the, make the whole, whole software easy to, to access. So this is a lot of demonstrations showing some, some grasping task. Um, and then I want to, okay, no, I, will, I will show a demo later, um, but essentially uh, 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 besides this thing, we actually also have uh, uh, make something that is not, it's actually quite disentangled from the purpose of the project. So essentially we, extend the mesh cat uh, from us and just snap. Um, so essentially we build a visualizer. Uh, essentially you, you can run your simulation, for example, your ISAC, and then you use this um, visualization uh, to visualize what's happening in real time. Um, so essentially you can think about, we actually separate the simulation and visualization into two servers. So you can run your simulation in your server and then you can run this visualizer in your laptop. So you can actually work from home uh, you don't need to have your desktop to, to do your robotics experiments every time. You can still run your things on the server and then uh, host your uh, visualizer at your laptop and everything. Um, so it's more convenient to do research this way. Um, so so we, we actually, I hope it works. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do something uh, like uh, risky. Um, so, uh, so, so let's see. Um, Okay, it shows, so, so this is basically what we have. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the, the hand with the arm, okay? So I'm going to run this guy. Um, so my student is online, so if it doesn't work, uh, we will try to, um, so okay. So this is the, the thing, and then we, we have the hands on the camera. So I think it's doing calibrations. Is it doing calibrations? If they do calibration correctly, the arrows will disappear. 
okay, let me <laughs> uh, let me just do it. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it working? No. Uh oh, that's why it's risky. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Somehow. Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, user might be online. Uh, I don't know. Can we restart the server? Uh, okay. There's something. <laughs> What, what did he say? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is okay. Good demo. Uh, the main block for research is always. Oh yeah. Right. So I can uh, do things like this and that. Yeah. So if I can zoom in a little bit more. Um, so, so it's like, um, so controlling these things. Um, so it's actually running on GCP. Yeah. yeah, so, so, so it's running on GCP and then um, uh, the, the server, the visualizer is running local. Um, so it's just uh, forwarding what I have to retargeting in GCP and then going back to this visualizer. Um, so this is kind of the system. Yeah, so, so that's, Okay, I'm glad it worked out. But yeah, so so I think you can imagine that if we can like do this kind of thing, like in, in front of this desktop, like, like uh, the MacBook camera, and then we have this only open in web browser. So essentially uh, the, the next step is actually, we, we just try to make it work with AWS. So we can train, we can collect data just with mechanical turkers and then um, essentially use this to data to this way to do a lot of large scale interaction data collections. Um, no, no VR, no AR, no, no controller, just, just cameras and web um, on, on the web browser. So, so that's the, yeah, so that's demo. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. In retargeting, uh, how, how do you reduce the number of uh, yeah, so there's basically, um, if you go into it, there's a, um, uh, we call tax vector retargeting. So essentially, um, we basically try, to, when we are doing grasping and things, uh, we try to model uh, how things are contacted. So we, we contact the objects. So we are modeling, uh, matching the contact point, essentially not matching exactly how the joint moves. We are matching after you move this joint, how things, how fingers is con going to contact the objects. So, so we're matching that to, to train uh, retargeting networks. The optimization approach to that in here, I think we, we train a small network to basically do that. Um, yeah, so, so that's what's happening here. So you can see, okay, okay, I can. So this is two finger, okay, three finger. And then four does not work, maybe because this is this, uh, not modeling in retargeting, but five, yeah. So this finger is working. Um, yeah, so, so one, Two, three, four doesn't work. Five, yeah. Um, so sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hope, hope that answers your questions. Yes. Does the retargeting network also control the arm, or is there separate? Yeah, it's a controlling. It's actually both arm and um, um and, and hand. Um, so full 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 thing controlling. Uh, it's not working that well because he actually. Uh oh. Oh, condition. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Doesn't work anymore. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. So it's, it's actually still full. Uh, oh, <laughs> he, he initialized. Um. So uh. So it's it's doing full body control kind of. Um. So yeah. It's doing arm and, and hand together. Um. Yeah. So yeah. So but uh, solving self collisions still. Um. Uh, it's, it's. I mean, there's always going to be collisions. Um, huh. So this is actually running in uh, AW, uh, in GCP, the Google Cloud Platform. So it's actually sending my information to GCP to do all the jobs and then sending it back to um, to to the uh, laptop. So so yeah, it's all real time happening. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that's that's good. Um, okay. I think then then I think there's no it's working. I'm glad uh, the risk is well taken. And um, yeah. So essentially, we have this system, and and then I think it's a potentially good way to scale up things. Um, uh, but then there's more and more things we can do to scale up the demonstrations. Uh, again, as a vision person, I was um, initially when I, this paper is very old actually, um, only got accepted recently uh, because this thing is very hard to get accepted by vision conference. Somehow the deadlines kept proposing, I keep submitting to vision conference. And anyways, so I, we, we were thinking about to learn imitation learning from human videos. So that's something that everyone kind of want to do. And, and, the, and the most interesting thing is that people try to scale up to YouTube videos or wherever. Of oh, then I, I was starting doing that as well, but then I figure out, find out that, um, so that the idea in here is you try to convert video to 3D and then you 3D to do retargeting to get robot demonstrations. And then you basically do imitation on that. Uh, but then the 3D is not really working. Right, so it's like, um, I mean, this is YCB objects. We, I talked to people doing YCB object post estimation today as well, but you can see that even this is YCB single object instance post estimation, uh, it's still shaking a lot when you're doing um, the post estimation. Um, so it, it doesn't really work well for this kind of background video and just fail completely from YouTube videos. Um, so there's a lot of barriers now to extract 3D in general from, from large scale videos. Um, so, so and pose is always a big pain for me. Um, so that's why we kind of extend. Uh, I try to basically also from a vision perspective, why why should we just keep staring at these twenty objects in YCB? I mean, I I bought this object for seven hundred dollars and wait for two months it, that arrive, uh, but then uh, we should just scale up the data. So what we did in here is just try to we collect the data set basically, so object centric data set. Um, RGBD videos, um, so it has 1,700 objects um, in category levels, and then try to make this uh, post estimation uh, better. And then we also have an extension on um, doing self-supervised way to do post estimation. Um, so this I research is basically motivated completely from, if I want to do imitation learning from human videos, how do I get 3D from it? Uh, we need to solve these 3D problems to, to get data. Um, so, so that's one direction. Of course, it's still very hard. That's why I then come to do teleoperation. Teleoperation is kind of one way to get around of this false 3D estimation, but that can ground through 3D from the simulators. Um, so there's two parallel directions we have. And then um, there's also, uh, uh, so, so a few works in the lab basically is focusing on once we have trained these forest policies, uh, you can see a lot of things are training in simulators using reinforced learning, imitation learning is also kind of RL plus uh, human data. So how do you do sit to real transfer? So one thing we, we have basically is that uh, for hands, essentially we find that um, it's quite uh, useful to, to basically capture vision using point cloud and to do sim to real transfer based on point cloud. So this is kind of a setup that you have simulation and real. And then we have this point cloud. Uh, there's also one simulation and real. Um, on the surface, I, I, can you actually like, can you see which one is real and sim? Like, is it easy to observe? I just play one more time. Which one is sim and which one is real? Is it anyone can can figure out which one is sim, which one is real? Huh? Which one is sim? Uh, it's kind of weird actually, but uh, right is real. Right sim, actually, because you have this right here. I think it's, um, yeah, this is actually sim, and this is real. Um, so we actually, this is, uh, we have the simulator, I think it's a function in Sapien now, that actually we, um, uh, you can basically uh, uh, simulate real sense. So you simulate how real sense work in, in real, and then you simulate in simulator, and then you basically have a more realistic point count rendering there. Um, so given this, uh, these things, we basically just end-to-end -end train a point cloud reinforcement learning policy. We do a lot of optimization to make uh, this point net and everything very, very fast, rendering a point cloud also very fast, also realistic. And then we are able to do uh, point cloud RL 
end to end, and then directly transfer to the real. So this is real. This is real points. Um, and then train on a lot of objects can also generalize to uh, a lot of objects. And open door is the same. Uh, uh, this door we we uh, we actually we do the crafting ourselves as well. Um, to so so we didn't make a lot of doors. Um, so one door, but we try to change the the handles. Um, try to show some generalization result. But essentially, we are just utilizing the generalization power of the visual representation to help the, the robot to, to generalize and then uh, using these kind of 3D representations. Um, yeah, okay. So, so that's the, 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 the manipulation part. I just want to go over it very fast for, for the sim to real. And I'm very excited about also the collaboration with GERD. This, this one uh, is actually a uh, locomotion control project that we take a visual input and then we do navigations and locomotion control together. Uh, it's interesting that this is a CVPR paper. Uh, it's also a highlight paper in CVPR that not a robotics conference actually submits uh, uh, a lot of papers to CVPR and most got accepted is robotics paper this year. I don't know why, um, but essentially uh, we are also doing sim to real. Um, so, so in here we have the front camera presents on the, on the head. Okay, so you, you train on this Isaac dream on different simulation environment. I think important point is that once you only have one camera on the head, uh, where are you going to uh, place your back leg? Um, so, so you need to kind of memorize what you see, and then you, you, you then understand how to you place your back leg after you go through some, something. Okay, um, so this is actually still a very challenging problem in the sense that, um, so if you go to see, uh, I actually want to show this slide. Let's go to this slide. I kind of skip because I'm afraid I have no time. Seems like I still have time. So there's actually a, a work, uh, like for example, works from other groups that do this kind of uh, thing. And then I think a very tricky thing is that when you are observing people showing demo, I'm not sure if you see there's someone moving uh, behind. So essentially, actually, there's always a human um, that, that is controlling the ro robot. They, they are using a remote control on the back, but they're just hiding uh, in the back so you cannot see. <laughs> um, so, so it's always there's a remote controlling the robot. That's how you make good demo. Like, like you just shoot the robot, you don't shoot the human. Um, so, so it actually largely reduced the difficulty of the work um, because you just, every time your, your robot goes sideways, oh, I just control it back. So, so it's, it's very easy way to good, make good demo, but it's reducing the, avoiding the real problem. So essentially what we try to do here is like we, we don't use human. Um, so, so we actually do end-to-end -end learning and then try to do a little bit path planning and, and the locomotion together. So, so that's why, um, so by doing this, we actually do need to have better 3D scene understanding, not just stacking frames, for example. So this is actually walking through the stones without human correcting you because if you have a human correcting you, once you go sideways a little bit, you can correct it back. So that makes the problem much easier. Um, but, but in here, we actually need to understand where stone is and then uh, have less control on that. Um, so this is going um, uh, climbing up, up the stairs. Um, so, so our report is basically focusing on just going forward as much as possible. Uh, so it does, you do see that it's going a little bit sideways in there. Um, so out, out of our control uh, in, in here. Um, yeah, so, so uh, there's different demos. So not sure why it's stuck in, um, but yeah. So essentially uh, the work in here, it is a CVPR paper because the main focus, the main technique we show in here are uh, actually, uh, uh, we have some 3D representation learning. So just, this is a lot of demo that you're showing that you, you can have a moving human and then you can try to avoid the humans. Um, um, so, so, so it's all automatic. <laughs> uh, so another comeback and then uh, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, so so the uh, on top is actually a Mac, mini MacBook. So so uh, it's not attached very well at that time. Uh, it's attached better. I think now it's attached better. Yeah. So uh, this video is not very it's very too high resolution. But essentially, uh, we are actually using something uh, from borrow something from view synthesis. Uh, we have a work back into 2021 on uh, video auto encoder. Uh, so this is some simulation we, we train on and do seem to real. So what we do is basically we try to extract uh, 3D representations when we are uh, giving these that input images. Okay, so from the from real camera, uh, we're using that. 
And then using some encoder, we can extract the 3D representations, like this is a big box of feature. And it's kind of what Vincent was working on before coming to MIT. There's some work on this voxel feature uh, space. Um, so you, you extract the voxel feature. You also train a network to kind of extract the relative pose between uh, the frames you have been through. So you have um, current frames and then you have all the previous frame. You kind of estimate the relative pose uh, between this current frame and the previous frame. And then what you do is you rotate all the previous frames feature into the current frame space. So you rotate everyone into the same base space and then you align them together and then you sum them together. So this is basically incorporating more geometry reasoning instead of just what we did usually in robot learning, we have multiple frames, we just stack them together, go to the CNN. Uh, we have more 3D things in here, extract 3D feature and line in 3D space, and then, and then combine them together to, to, to give the, the, the network a neural volumetric memory. It's not, never mind. It's real volumetric memory, um, so NVM. Uh, so, so this memory combining some state information um, to do the, uh, the local motion control. And the learning part in here is basically done by the representation is trained using view synthesis loss. So essentially you have the uh, current views and have different views. You just use current views voxel feature and then try to rotate it to synthesize another view uh, used for construction to help you train, train the feature. Uh, so, so there's some similar work in NERF, uh, I think in this space as well, but I think different from NERF, this is much faster. And then also uh, it's a generalizable feature that you can train on many, many, many scenarios and then directly apply in a feed forward manner. Do not need any actual reconstruction. Um, um, so, so that's basically the, the, the framework in here um, also makes it a CVPR paper because it's, um, um, I love the vision self-supervised learning and how self-supervised learning helps navigation. Um, any, any questions or any, yeah. Let me, okay. Oh, okay, it's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so so that's the the lack of locomotion part. Um, and then um, I'm still um, I'm still a computer vision person. So I did a lot of things still in old school uh, um, vision stuff. Um, so this is a recent work that we did open uh, open vocabulary segmentation. Um, so. Uh, we get pretty good results. Uh, this is um, um, so so some some examples basically showing that uh, this is slow. But um, uh, so it's about you do segmentation, but it's not on the fixed categories. Um, so it's on the open categories. You can have all these kind of categories like street sign um, and, and, and the flag and these things. Um, they are not existing in just a particular data set, but uh, on general data set. I like the Rico centric a lot because it's also eventually helps me to get more human demonstrations to 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 learn to do robot learning um, so the first step you do need to have the better 2d uh, inference in here and i think the uh, the interesting thing about this work is that uh, it's not just about its performance but actually how we do it um, so we we basically figure out that um, so we we have a lot of fancy things like now working with these diffusion models uh, you can use the uh, input noise and generate very beautiful pictures. And then the idea is basically if the diffusion model is doing so well, in the, because you can generate the picture. So you must understand the structure and, and information about uh, how general the visual world looks like. Um, so you, you can have very strong structure understanding uh, inside this kind of uh, uh, network of feature. Um, so can itself be served as a feature extractor? So essentially that's our contribution. Basically, we, we try to use this kind of stable diffusion pre-train network and then use it as um, a, a, a kind of the feature extractor in this pipeline. So essentially what we do is given an image, we just extract this, like um, uh, use this to, to uh, help us to generate some proposals. And then we do some transformer thing on top. And then we, we also train our image tags, um, uh, contrastive learning to, to basically uh, learn this framework. Um, so I, I'm not going to get into the details, but essentially really the central part in this thing is that we, we do a lot of engineering work to make it work. And then also um, stable diffusion feature can still be a very good uh, structure understanding model um, that can help us to extract better features. Um, we have a demo online. 
if you uh, if you want to play, you can do it. Um, so I, I think we, uh, we we meet John today, and then he also play a few self-driving car things he likes. Uh, we I, I think I met Luca last week as well. He also we play some robot uh, images. It works pretty well. And this is an image actually that's a back image. Uh, like uh, people uh, show online and then they, they also test our model on synthetic images and still um, uh, works pretty well. Um, and then there's also a, uh, we, we put in the, the Super Mario video um, and it's, it's uh, shrinking a lot it's, it's, uh, because it's not actually doing tracking. So, so for instance, segmentation uh, is just use different color to represent different instance if you don't connect in time. So it's, uh, it's basically flashing a lot, but but essentially, if you look at the Mario, it's actually still uh, yeah, yeah, detecting uh, the, the Super Mario. Um, yeah, so so it can be a useful thing in general, I think, uh, for for not vision but also robotics tasks. Uh, distill the feature like wherever you want. Use it to to get uh, foreground objects to do three D reconstruction. Um, so there's a lot of potential in here. Um, and then last thing I want to mention, I, I, I'm not going to talk about this work, but uh, how to use, uh, going back, how to use your foundation model or pre-trained model. Um, so, so a lot of work is basically try to use it to extract feature representations. What we try to do in here is like use foundation model to help you to provide a reward essentially. Um, so this framework is pretty simple. You can watch this demo. So essentially, it's a language-based uh, kind of manipulation. They ask you to pack the star, and then you do the wrong thing. And then when, when the robot does the wrong thing, how, uh, we need to tell it it's doing the wrong thing. And then basically, the clip model knows what you have just done. And then you give you the labels, basically, like, like uh, correct. So you have the trajectory and the correct label corresponding to it. So you can retrain your thing. So it's trying to pick up a triangle, but it's not successful. Uh, it doesn't know what it has done. And then the clip model tells you, oh, you're actually picking, packing this, uh, this, this yellow thing in, into the box. And, and um, that basically gives you a correct labels to, to do uh, retraining. Um, so, so one way to look into it is basically your foundation model is not necessarily always a generator, uh, but it can be a discriminator. Um, so it's just like uh, your advisor is more, it's, it's functioning better by uh, giving you advice than coding themselves. Um, so yeah, so so this is uh, one way to look into it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, in general, that's that's what I have today. Uh, so I think manage in time. Um, so there's a lot of applications, mainly focusing on low level skills, on, on hands and legs. And then also basically a lot of things are also driven by vision. So the idea itself, like training on large scale data, try to generalize to more scene and more objects, uh, it's more like from a vision perspective and then how to develop better vision models um, to, to serve for, for this kind of uh, purpose uh, is also something our lab is focusing on. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're open for question. Anybody? Uh, questions? Okay, I guess like I have a question about like basically the touch one. So I saw that there's a lot of like a physical contact between uh, between the the side of the fingers and the objects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We are we are we are missing that. That's also we we notice. Um. So it's very important to let's see. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, what speaking in the in Zoom. In the who, who is who is speaking? Yeah, I think in like on the side. Like this part, um, we, it, it, I think we, we find out it actually is quite often contacting this side. So we do have some plan on placing the tactile in this side. Um, so yeah, so this is something. And honestly, when we are first doing this work, we just like uh, arranging the tactile in this way. Uh, we didn't tune it after we see how the policy works. So essentially you can observe that for tactile eight and seven, there's no signal, okay. Um, so the eight uh, and seven, there's two rows there, there's no signal. Um, so, so there are one or two sensors actually usually does not touch anything. Um, so this, yeah, so we, we totally can redesign uh, the tactile back based on like uh, how the policy works. And usually uh, this, this side of um, uh, fingers is still is, um, yeah, tactile. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. 
Um, so this is quite an impressive work that only utilize like a binary sensors. Do right. you think there is something to gain from somehow using like a full information that come from tactile sensing, like the forces and everything? Yeah, um, ideally there is, but uh, we actually do uh, comparisons because we are doing sim to real. So uh, you, you actually align simulation and real, but then actually uh, the force sensing in sim and real are still very, very different. Um, for example, FSR is quite fragile in the sense that we need to do some hack to make it sensitive. So essentially, if you just placing on a solid surface on the, of an SSR, FSR is not very sensitive. We actually need to put something underneath, uh, something soft underneath, and then press it, and then it becomes useful. So, so the, the force sensing in here in general is, I think, uh, is quite, still quite not aligned between sim and real. That makes it just more hard. So we actually need different threshold thing um, to, to like sim and real, we have different threshold. We need to match that a little bit to make it transfer better. Yeah, so, so I think it's just, it's just the sim and real is not really matching. That's why we cannot do too much, contain too much information. In general, I feel like it's also why learning is useful in the sense that we want to make the sensor as simple as possible, as binarized as possible, and then use learning to uh, kind of do in painting, in paint all the other functions out. Um, so, so I think that's the philosophy I kind of try to follow. Uh, yeah, instead of designing more that more and more dedicated sensors. Yes. Um, I guess we have uh, okay two more questions. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. I have a question regarding the um, the depth camera representation. Point. Right. Um, so I'm wondering after the like you extract features from the current step and also the previous steps after you collect all these features in the like never mind block, right. um, so, uh, <laughs> how to how much like how many dimensions do you reduce it to? Um, I think if I remember correctly, so this one is like kind of thirty two cross thirty two cross thirty two um, kind of dimension. So this two hundred fifty six like twenty twenty four kind of dimension. Um, so it's like eight or eight times each. Um, so still having reasonable large information. And then I'm not sure if I have the reconstruction results at all, but let me go to the website. Um, so we, we have some uh, reconstruction uh, volumetric. Um, so, so we, I hope this video has that. Yeah, so, so this is kind of, okay. It's, it's trained on theme. So, so this is basically on, on one view, based on one view, and then you do view synthesis. Let me see if there are more reconstruction results. Um, yeah, so this is more like a real synthesis results that you based on this scene and then you place on different camera and then you synthesize the, the, the scene. I mean, it's not perfectly reconstructed, uh, but, you, but the main structure is still maintained quite well. Um, so it's kind of sufficient to, uh, to, to, for, for the robot to understand the scene. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder like, how, how large is the dimension you put in a policy training? The policy training, so the image, uh, okay. So, so, the, so this part, um, this part is still uh, kind of uh, uh, 30, so, so after doing these voxels, uh, we, we did do like kind of like a average pouring and then we concatenate with this. Um, so when it gets to policy, it's already like a vector mm -hmm. and then it goes to the uh, combined with the state representation to, to the policy, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, small question. Uh, I was just wondering for the the touch reorientation, uh -huh. uh, if you knew what the controller frequency was? Uh, the con control frequency? Yeah. Um, I think it's 40 hertz. Um, I think that that's, I think that's the, yeah, the 40, 40, 40 hertz. I think you can actually go to, I like your hand can go to 330. Uh, 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 we are doing some dynamic manipulation now. Uh, we, we can go to 330, but in this one, we just do 40. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks everyone for the great questions and thank you for the talk. Okay, thank you.